What is the greatest sign? How do we get ready? Um, is so-and-so the Antichrist? Um, should we uh, be concerned about all the, you know, microchip medical implant stuff? And, um, and how, I, I can't remember all of them, but what I thought is, as, as I put all those together, I thought about Christ introducing this topic. So tonight, if you uh, want to turn with me to Matthew 24, and then if I just breeze right through this, um, then we can have more um, questions. So you can be thinking about them, and we'll take them from the floor. But this is almost a... Uh, I don't know how to describe it, kind of like a, a new paradigm for many of us prophecy lovers, what Jesus emphasizes. Because when we think about it, uh, what was the most repeated sign of the end of days in the New Testament, which is an amalgam of all these things, because what I was being asked is, how do we get ready, and is this the, the one, and should we be aware of that, and is this election going to do this or this? And what I thought is that, the, that when Jesus presented the scenario and, and he he devoted this entire 24th chapter as well as the 13th chapter of mark we'll see in the in also the 21st chapter a part of it of luke jesus emphasized something different than us he was not talking about don't get the social security number and watch your credit card and you know be careful and this and that he he lifted the the entire emphasis one whole degree higher, one whole notch higher. And that's, that's what I want to show you tonight. Uh, the end of days, in other words, the way that Jesus describes the, the whole climactic conclusion to human history, the end of days is a biblical term. Uh, Jesus parallels with the earth's darkest hour. Now I want you to think about what you already know, because remember, Satan can read. Remember that. Satan is an angel. Uh, he is a living spirit. He knows every language of the world. A baby can learn a language in 14, 16 months. The devil can learn them very rapidly. He knows every language. He can hear. He's been everywhere. And he has millions, if not billions, of little helpers that are feeding him. So he knows what the... He's already read what God said. And the Bible says, The great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, we saw that term this morning. God loves that, that term to describe all the peoples of the earth, are standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And that happens to be, in chapter 7 of Revelation, coming up out of what is described, and no matter what persuasion you are, uh, theologically or eschatologically, everyone agrees that this group are coming out of a horrific time on the earth, and, and which the Bible describes as the time of Jacob's troubles, or we call the New Testament term is the tribulation. So out of this Revelation 7, 9 time, Satan already knows there's this huge ingathering of people. So to thwart God's harvest, remember the devil is always trying to thwart, put a blockade in the way, um, you know, drown Jesus in the boat, have him stoned to death in the temple. You know what I mean, uh, have a king kill all the babies. It's Satan knows God's plan, and he's trying at every um, possible turn to cut it off. And so what he's trying to do is, he's trying to prevent the world from coming to Christ. So what's his way? Deploying a legion of liars, people who distort the truth because as we'll see in a moment the only way you can be saved is to receive a love of the truth if you never receive a love of the truth you can be deceived and so satan has these false signposts and i mean have you ever you know been looking for something and the kids have played around you're going garage sailing you know and the kids in the neighborhood have turned around and the streets you can tell right away because you know what street you're on and yet you see that street going that way and you know that someone's trying to fool you well, if you don't know the Word of God and someone turns the signpost and points in the wrong direction, Satan knows that he can get people to follow that. So that's always been. Satan works usually behind a cleric's collar. He is most, he doesn't work, you know, in the massage parlors and the meth labs. That all operates all on its own. Immorality, drugs, alcoholism, all that stuff. You know, the, all that stuff just goes on its own. Where Satan is most at work, we'll see, is in religious deception. 
And so this, this concept isn't new to right now, and most of them you know, are on the radio and television and, and uh, are voluminous in their, in their output, but false teachers have been a part of the landscape from the start. So the most repeated description in the end of days, and this is what I want to show you starting in verse 4. In Matthew 24, in fact, you can mark these. I, I like to daisy chain my Bible. So if you have your pen with you tonight, you can just circle these words and, and I connect them just so that the next time I see the flow. But look at, at verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one, what? What does your Bible say? Deceive. Deceives you. Okay, look at verse 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will, what's the word? deceive many there's the second time look down at verse 11 and many false prophets will rise up and there it is again deceive and keep going down to verse 24 for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to now this one is amazing to deceive if it were even possible the elect that means that the the level of deception is going to be at such a level that if it wasn't for God's supernatural intervening work, even believers, even those who are indwelt by the Spirit of God, could be led away from the truth and into the devil's way. But the Lord said, I'm not going to allow that. I will not allow that. So that's why it says, if it were even possible. It's not possible. Okay, first of all, let's do a little study. This word... The word deceive is a Greek word, planao. Now, all of you know that. It's, it's into the English language. It's, come, it's one of those transliterated. Remember I told you that, that some words aren't translated. That means the foreign language word is translated into what it means in English. Some of them are just slid across, which is called transliteration, which means it sounds the same in both languages. Now, one of them you all know. In the English Bible, baptism, bapto. Bapto, baptos is the Greek word, baptisms. What does baptism mean? I don't know. Baptism. You know, it, it, it isn't, bapto is never translated in the English Bible. Now, the reason for that is that when the King James Version was being translated, the king was paying for it. That's why it's called King James's Version. You know, he paid for it. And the church in England believed in infant baptism. And if the translators would have translated baptism for what it means, which is to dip, to immerse, to overwhelm, people would have questioned the clergy and said, why aren't you dipping and overwhelming my child? Why are you doing this? But because of the practice, they didn't translate it. If they translated it, we wouldn't have all the denominational disputes because it would have been very clear what was happening. So, same thing is here. Planes planetes has come into the English language. What is it? It's the word for planets. Now think about this. If you lived in the ancient world and you didn't have, you know, electronic devices and television and cable and your computer and electricity, period, your day was, you know, basically sunrise to sunset. And if you wanted to have some fun, you would lay out at night and look at the stars. There wasn't much else to do, especially if you were agrarian, you lived out, you know, in the fields. And so people would just lay there, and what they did is they watched the stars, and the stars were always the same. Now, they, had, they, they learned that there's constellations, and they, they went on this cycle, but they noticed that the stars were fixed. But then after a while, a few of them started saying, wait a minute, that star was there last night, but that star is there. Whoa. And there were stars that planaot, that that weren't fixed, they wandered. They, they, they moved without moorings. And those were called the planetes, which we know today as the planets. That these, these stars that didn't have a fixed position were wanderers to the ancients. They didn't know that, that there was a solar system and that there were planets until the telescope was invented. So there were two kinds of stars. There were the fixed stars and there were the wandering stars. Deception Planetes, planao, means to wander, not fixed to a point, but floating, drifting, wandering. The devil wants people to not be fixed. Now, have you ever heard people say, oh, doctrine, oh, it's so divisive, oh, so boring, doctrine, you know? Let's, doctrine divides. You bet it does. It's intended that way. 
And, and what the devil wants people to do is to wander away from doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of inspiration, the doctrine of whatever doctrine. So when Jesus was asked, look what it says in verse 1. When Jesus went out and departed from the temple, I'm in Matthew 24, and his disciples says, wow, look at all these buildings. And, uh, and Jesus said to them, don't you see all these things? Verse 2, assuredly I say unto you, not one stone will be left upon another that will shall not be thrown down. That's one of the highlights of the whole journey to the land of the book. You can actually go to the fulfillment of a prophecy. Jesus said every single stone of this temple is, is going to be cast down. And you know what? Today in Jerusalem, they've excavated and pulled back the dirt. And the A.D. 70 destruction of Jerusalem, the Romans completely scraped off every trace of that temple and threw it over the top and just massive piles of boulders and you can sit on a pile that's a fulfillment of Jesus saying not even two stones are going to be one on top of another. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, verse 3, the disciples came privately. They said, well you were telling everybody that. We want to know more details. What will, when will these things be, verse 3, and what will be the sign of your coming? So you notice Jesus was asked about the end of days and what is his very first description of that future apocalyptic end time? Look what it says in your Bible. Jesus answered and said to them, signs of the times, prophecy, the end. He didn't pull out a chart. He said, take heed that no one planao, planetases you. Make sure, make sure that you get fastened to truth, that you know truth, that you be able to explain truth. Did you know we, we have a, a real challenge? Calvary Bible Church has a real challenge. We are so into the truth and we talk about it and, and we believe it and we have it at home and we have it at church and we build our lives around a church schedule but there are these little people growing up around us. And it's different to just hear all this and to actually be able to explain and defend it. Those are two completely separate things. And we've been talking on staff about over the years how many of those that, that are the most successful in all of our children's ministries and youth ministries, and they wash out and don't believe anymore when they go to college. What happened? Verse 4, be careful that no one that, that you have such a fixed position, you know, it, it's amazing, um, head coverings, uh, of, because there's the controversy about head coverings in the Bible, because in the same passage it's talking about the role of women in the church, all these churches says, oh, well, we can't know anything from the Bible, we can have women pastors and we can have women elders, and, and you know what happens as soon as you do that and say that's just cultural well then so is homosexuality just cultural and by the way infanticide must be too because it was practiced in the biblical times right and so there are no fixed any things whether they be social issues or doctrinal issues and that's why as you'll see a little later the whole controversy people they call people that believe in doctrine Islamophobic I'm not afraid of Islam it's just Islam is damnably deadly doctrine. Jesus Christ is God's son, and he died as a substitute, and he is Jesus, the son of Yahweh, Jehovah, is not the same as Allah. Allah is a generic name that's loaded with doctrinal meaning to the Muslims. And there's nothing wrong with saying truth, and we aren't supposed to coddle people and say, well, you know, we don't want to be divisive. Yes, we do. We do. We want to be divisive because if we don't see anything, we aren't hindering them from going the wrong direction, the way of destruction. So Jesus said, don't be deceived. Okay, look at verse 11. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive. Verse 24, false Christ. Now, what's interesting is that pseudo. Um, if I was giving you false currency, I wouldn't paint it blue. I mean, do you ever get your money counted back and one of them's red and you go, oh, wait a minute, what's that? And you look at it, I don't want that, you know. Someone has highlighted or marked it, you don't want that. In, in fact, uh, when my daughters were headed back to Honduras, they went through all of their money, were counting, and overseas they won't even take ripped bills. I mean, even a little rip, or those ones where they have a stamp and it says, see where George goes. People overseas don't like any, uh, you know, amending of the currency. And the Lord says, 
Don't let anybody pseudo Christ. Don't let them make a false representation of Christ or false prophets, pseudo prophets. These are going to rise and show great, what did Jesus say? Signs and wonders. Did you know miracle working is not a proof of God? Doctrine is? Oh, isn't it amazing that the greatest time of deception at the end of days is going to be accompanied with people who can do signs and wondrous miracles? Wow, think about that. Because a lot of people are enamored with the, the power, signs, and wonders thing where, I mean, I, I have a book in my library. You want to read it? There's a guy in Indonesia who can heal washing machines. He can heal them. And he can raise from the dead. Everywhere he goes, he can raise people from the dead and heal washing machines and do all kinds of stuff. And if you'll just give $5,000, we'll keep his campaign going. Yeah, but what is he teaching when he's healing the washing machines? See, that's how you verify. And you know what else? A true prophet, whatever they say, happens. And if it doesn't, Deuteronomy 18 says, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. You don't, you don't allow for... Jeannie Dixon-esque prophecy. Any of you don't remember from the 60s, there was a clairvoyant named Jeannie Dixon, and she'd say something, but it was so vague that about 10 things could come true. No, God says exact, or it's false. See, and there's going to be these, these signs and wonder workers who deceive. They do all this, this, this fantastic stuff, but then they water down the truth about Christ. Jesus says the same thing. By the way, Jesus was asked the similar question, the, the Sermon on the Mount of Olives discourse, and, and Mark 13 records the same sermon. Take heed, no one deceives you. Luke is the same thing. Uh, don't be deceived, Jesus said. So when Christ returns, now we come to not what Jesus said, now his beloved apostle. And, and you should go to Revelation 13 because I want to describe this for you. You know, everybody's always saying, who is the Antichrist? Do you know who he's going to be? He's going to be someone that's like Ronald Reagan and Julius Caesar and Bill Clinton, you know, Mr. Orator of our day, and someone that is an absolute genius, elocutionist. He's probably going to be the most winsome person you've ever seen because he's going to be like Jesus Christ. He's going to be so kind, so gentle. We all think of the Antichrist as this big, you know, sharp, toothed monster no it's going to be like christ he is anti does not mean against means in place of which ends up being against but but watch when christ returns there's a powerful pervasive universal leader who speaks eternally damnable lies backed by the most believable signs and wonders ever witnessed Revelation 13, 14, and, and, and again, that's why I want you to daisy wheel these. The most prevalent sign is religious deception, and I could wear you out tonight, taking you through, and, and I'm not even doing the minor prophecies, I'm not doing the major prophecies, and I'm not even doing the even mosaic talking about the future. Just the easy ones. Revelation 13, 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth. Um, other than a few people in the Skylab or whatever, our current space station, where do all people live, by the way? On the earth. Every living human being, other than a few that are in space, all the rest live on the earth. Maybe some are, you know, in airplanes and some are in submarines. But look what it says. He deceives those who dwell on the earth. So, so humanity is universally deceived by the signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. This is talking about his false prophet, his, his sidekick, his right-hand man. Now, chapter 1920, God describes the Antichrist himself. The beast, the Antichrist, by the way, he has 33 different titles in the, old, in the Old New Testament. The Antichrist, the man of sin, and the lawless one. And I mean, you can just go through you know, the, all these different terms. But it's this one super man. Super man. Isn't that where all of our movies are going? All these action, super powerful heroes? This guy is super powerful. Uh, and he, he, the beast and the false prophet, verse 20, who worked uh, signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. 
in the next chapter, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up in a seal on him so that he should deceive. That's the devil now, the one. See, it's Satan who is behind all this sign and wonder stuff and deception. And Satan is cast in the bottomless pit uh, to deceive the nations no more till the thousand years. And the devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. By the way, if you've ever wondered, um, I'm not even on that tonight, but if you've ever wondered whether the notion of hell being incineration, that you know you just go there and burn up and it's over, it, it lasts at least a thousand years because those two in this line were cast in alive, the beast and the false prophet, and they're still alive a thousand years later because the devil's thrown in with them. Isn't that interesting? You don't get incinerated in, in hell. But you notice the deceive, 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 deceive. This powerful universal leader, John says, watch out, he is deceptive. As the end of days, Satan sends to the earth an expression of all of mankind's desires and the person of the Antichrist. In a very short time, almost all the earth will follow him. You know, that's one of the saddest things about biblical prophecy, that Jesus himself came, who was God in human flesh, and very few ended up following him. When it got tough, John 6 says most of his followers stopped following him. The high tide of Christ's ministry is the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, and it goes downhill from then on. Fewer and fewer and fewer. So that probably many of those who were saying, crucify him, crucify him, had been healed or fed. And they just drifted away. But the sad thing is, the longer that Satan's man works, he gets almost all the earth to follow him. Do you remember what Jesus said? Follow me. And very few did. And very few do today. And the devil gets a shot at the earth. And he gets almost everybody to follow him. It's one of the saddest commentaries on humanity. The heart of humanity is so bad, wanting always the wrong choice. The Antichrist, like Satan, comes to kill and steal and destroy. Christ, on the other hand, came to offer abundant life. That's John 10. And you know, the best prophetic preparation is to receive Christ so that we're not deceived, so that we're not taken in by this evil one. When you call upon Christ to save you from your sins, God delivers you from the power of darkness and from the eternally damnable lies and actually transfers us into the kingdom of his dear son. Well, real quickly, just during the tribulation period um, and today, there are two types of people on the planet. Now look at 2 Thessalonians 2 with me because this is another one that you should mark. You know, most people, when they're marking stuff, they're marking how many of the toes and what color the toes of the beast are and you know what I mean. They're just always looking and, and flooding, you know, every time some new technology comes out. Actually, the thing that God emphasizes is truth and not being deceived. And so 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, look at the first six verses and, and basically uh, Paul says that that the two kinds of people are the lovers of truth and those who've never gotten that divinely implanted love for the truth. And he says, Now, brethren, born-again people, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken, either by spirit or by word, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above. You notice again the deception, man of sin, falling away from what? Falling away from truth. See, that's what, what Paul is saying is when you start seeing religious deception becoming greater and greater and greater and greater and greater in power, be careful because that's a sign of the devil's last you know, thrust into the world is to, to cause this spiritual darkness. And Paul says, I told you these things, and now what is restraining uh, is restraining, and he'll be revealed. Now keep going to verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Most likely speaking of the Holy Spirit indwelling the believers as a restraining salt and light in the earth. And when believers are pulled out, the restraint, it's almost like pulling the rods out of the reactor uh, the, that are absorbing all the neutrons. When you pull those graphite rods out, 
the reaction just builds until it explodes. And when the restraint of the Spirit of God, because of the people of God, that's why we're here. We're supposed to be impacting the world. Uh, but when that happens, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy the brightness of his coming. And by the way, the, the lawless one is revealed after uh, he is taken out of the way. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan with power. Now notice what it says in verse 9. With all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception. Did you, did you catch this? Paul is talking about the end. He's not talking about storms. And he's not talking about solar flares, even though all that's fun and exciting and they come. He's talking about religious deception. That's the most prevalent sign. And the, the church's decline in biblical literacy, and more importantly, in doctrinal literacy, in, in being aware of doctrine. And, and notice what it says in verse 10. With all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why do people perish eternally? Verse 10, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. You understand that, that what God does in the salvation process is he implants within people a longing. Remember, that's what Acts 17 talks about. You'll seek me and, and, and feel after me, Paul says, that they might feel after God, and he is not far from anyone. What are those people feeling for? They're desiring truth, and they're saying, we know you're out there, we know, and they're groping in the darkness, but they're trying to feel, how come they're doing that? Because God has placed within them this longing for the truth. So when you find people that are asking questions, if they're legitimate, you know, there's two kinds of questions. There's questions that are tearing down. They're questioning truth itself. There's others that are trying to put it together. And when you find that, you're very likely probably finding someone the Lord's implanted the love of the truth and you help them, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Who does he send that to? Now, be very careful. It never says in the Bible. It only says in, in popular prophetic books. But it doesn't say in the Bible that no one who ever hears the gospel before Christ's return can never be saved after. That is a popular thing. In fact, I remember growing up Remember, I grew up in the Hal Lindsey era, and preachers used to say, and if you don't receive Christ, if the rapture comes tonight, you won't be able to be saved after the rapture. And I thought, where did you find that? Because it's not in the Bible. This is what they're talking about. This is a verse, but it doesn't say that. All it says is that if people do not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, God sends them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What it means is God is going to flood the world with, with Satan's powerful delusions to show that only those that he supernaturally places within them the love of the truth can be saved. That's how strong the, the attack of Satan will be. That they can all be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, real quickly, uh, now we'll talk about something that sadly is a the butt of many jokes. You ever heard of the fundamentalists, you know, and, and you know, uh, those fundamentalists, and you, there's all these caricatures. Most people don't even know what fundamentalist means. About a hundred years ago, it was actually uh, started before that, but the greatest Bible teachers of a hundred years ago banded together to put up the flag of truth because after Darwin's publication of his origin of the species. It just basically undermined everybody and people started doubting everything and, and the whole mechanism of liberalism cranked up and that's where we had all the, uh, you know, this idea that, that if you fix culture, you'll fix people instead of preaching the truth and having born again individually, we've got to clean up society and all that stuff. And so they banded together and what those men did is now a common form of mockery in the world. They sat down and declared what were the non-negotiables of the faith. So if you ever heard of fundamentalism, it was a hundred years ago, a declaration in a seven-volume set among the greatest known Bible teachers of the day. It would be like if we had, you know, MacArthur and Piper and, you know, Charles Stanley and Billy Graham and... I don't know who, Chuck Swindoll, all get together and, and you know, Ken Ham and a few others that, that are renowned, you know, gospel teaching, and they wrote together this, this declaration. That's, and I'll show you who they were. As the, 
At the end of days, truth is under attack and lies will abound. That's why Jesus said, watch out for false teachers and counterfeits. And when faced with that situation at the turn of the century, 1909 to 1915 is when they produced this. Now look who they were. R.A. Torrey. He's the man that was Dwight L. Moody's assistant, and he founded Biola. If you ever heard of Biola, Bible Institute of Los Angeles. That's what Biola means. And it was just to put Moody on the West Coast uh, in a different form to teach the scripture. And so Tory went out there. B.B. Warfield from Westminster Seminary was one of the most renowned doctrinal. I mean, he defended his, his treatment on inspiration is still a classic. J.C. Ryle was the, the kind of like the John Piper, uh, maybe, maybe uh, uh, like uh, Charles Stanley. He was just a very popular devotional writer. G. Campbell Morgan was an expository, wouldn't preach on any verse of the Bible until he read it 40 times uh, from the Westminster pulpit in England. C.I. Schofield was kind of like the Charles Ryrie of his day. He wrote the, the first popular study Bible. James M. Gray was the president of Moody Bible Institute. A.T. Pearson, another great devotional writer. And these men distilled down the fundamental beliefs. And by the way, there's a whole group of them. These were just the more well-known ones from the list. I could have given you more of the list, and they're just theologians. Uh, but they put out this book, set of books called The Fundamentals. And what they said is, these are the non-negotiables. Now, let me show you what they said the non-negotiables were. Here are the seven things these books were. Number one, they said, in order not to planes, wander, to be fixed, and not to become a deceived one, you've got to make sure that you know and believe what God says about his word. So they affirm the inspiration and reliable historicity of the Bible. So in 1909, they said the Bible is accurate. Any statement the Bible makes about history, science, uh, anything that it makes about those topics, it's not a science book, and it's not an encyclopedia. It's not exhaustive. But if it says anything about history or science, it's reliable. And by the way, nothing the Bible says about history and science has ever been disproven. In fact, if, if you collect books like I do, you can look at books that are 100, 200, 300 years old, and science has finally caught up. Because remember, science is observation. And... and if it's scientific, it's reproducible. You understand that, that, that you can observe and then reproduce this, this, this concept. That's why they don't allow them to publish it until somebody else can reproduce what the scientists supposedly did. And so there is this element of science, and nothing that is listed in the Bible that is scientific in nature has been disproven. Rather, it shows that the Bible was thousands of years ahead of science because God observed. Secondly, creation. Now, this is interesting. This is not a modern Ken Ham thing or Henry Morris. This has been going on for 100 plus years. God is revealed from cover to cover, they said in 1909, as the creator of the universe, just as described in the Bible. And so what they said is evolutionism and Darwinism are planes. The greatest Bible teachers of 100 years ago warned people about evolutionary thought, and Darwinistic thought. And what's amazing is nowadays, uh, and I won't even, you already heard Ken Ham say it, some very popular Christian speakers don't believe in, in creation the way God presents it. They've got their own version. And it's sad. Doctrine, God's word teaches clear doctrines about Jesus Christ and his church. So they specifically named the cults presenting false gospel in their days. And they said the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Christian Science, and Spiritism. Those were the, the key false teachings of the day. And they said that, that those were wrong. Depravity, they declared the reality of sin and they affirmed that man is not basically good. See, this is the, the time when we were, uh, I don't know if you've ever read, uh, uh, I forget the name of the guy, but it's the one, What Would Jesus Do?, it's a beautiful book, and the WWJD is beautiful stuff, but the book is bad. Because you know what that book is about? It's not about the gospel. If you ever read that in his, I think it's called In His Steps or something like that, it's a social gospel. Move into the inner city, clean up the neighborhood, feed the people, educate them, teach them, and it'll just change culture. Yeah, it will. There's nothing wrong with changing culture. That is not the gospel. The gospel is not clean up, build a habitat home, you know, get crime out of the area. Unless you realize the crime is coming from the heart. 
They have to have a new heart. They have to have a heart transplant. Give them a new house and give them a new education and everything else, but give them a new heart and don't leave that out. And see, what was happening is people were, they were having this, this notion that if we can just clean up the mess, people will get better. No, they're incurably ill. The, the heart is desperately wicked. Unless you get a heart transplant, no matter how nice an environment you get in, you'll pollute it. And so they reaffirmed the depravity of man, substitution. This is when the whole blood thing I talked about this morning was, was warming up. People did not want to talk about the blood of Christ. So they said God's word only presents biblical salvation is received, is received only by faith in the God incarnate Christ Jesus who became sin for sinners to save them. And his substitutionary death was the sacrifice on the cross. Imputation, by the way, Imputation is the key doctrine that has to do with Roman Catholicism. They believe in infusion, not imputation. You, you go to the hospital for infusion, you have a little bag hanging there with a little cord and in your arm, and they bring and they go in the bag, put a little something in there, and it just drips in you. And as long as you have the bag attached, you just keep moving along, doing great. God doesn't operate that way. He doesn't infuse a little drip of grace. He gives it all to us. And we are saved by his grace once and for all at the instant of salvation, not drippings from the church. So they said, imputation, God's word teaches that salvation cannot be earned at any level and it cannot be dispensed uh, by God nor by any church and cleric. In other words, that God does not go through distributors. It's not like you own the franchise, you know, and, and you pass it out to the distributors and that they deliver it for you. No, no, it's not that way. They clearly expose the errors of Roman Catholicism and every other religion of human achievement and works righteousness. They were universal in this. Just like the Reformers were, and just like all the people since the Reformers. Did you know, until sometime in the 20th century, there was universal agreement in the church that Romanism was damnably error? But now... When we started the, you know, promise keepers and the moral majority and everything else, you know, they have, Roman Catholicism is 99% good doctrine. They just have rat poison in there, right? And the rat poison is works, human achievement, that, that you go through the sacramental system and that you get your sins washed away by water. The Bible never says water washed away sins. And so... They reaffirmed imputation way back 100 years ago. And finally, Christology. They, the most fervently declared that all error starts in some way with an incorrect view of Christ. So they strongly affirm the deity and the personal visible return of Christ. And so those were the seven. And you can look, and, and books are getting unpopular. You can find a nice set of the, the fundamentals from 100 years ago on Amazon for just a pittance because nobody buys books anymore. But what's happened is that what the clarion warning that Christ gave, that John gave, that, that Paul gave, and then that the fundamentalist writers of the seven-volume set started talking about 100 years ago, everything they said has happened. It's kind of like the frog in the pot thing. You know, you drop a frog into to just, you know, room temperature water, and he's fine, and you just slowly warm it up, and you kill him. Well, you just slowly take away doctrine in the church. I mean, you start... I mean, who wouldn't rather watch movie clips than carry a big, heavy book that's boring and you don't understand it anyway, right? So just, just entertain them and just, just make them determine church by whether it, it meets my felt needs, whether or not it's entertaining, whether it's, gra you know, just, just gravitates your kids to it because they can all jump in a different, you know, little tube and ride down to a, a place where there's free drinks and free everything. And, and do they learn true doctrine? I don't know, but they love it. See, it's all over. I remember when I was in Tulsa, they had 10 foot high Star Wars characters and every kid got their own big chair with an Xbox or whatever it was back then. Every kid in the youth group. They, I mean, not to take home, they just could sit in it. That was the youth group. You just sat there blasting away with music playing, Christian music, I guess, and sipping soda. I mean, who would want to go to that youth group? And the parents didn't think that it was happening.
The longer I live, the more alarmed I am at the growing trend of biblical literacy and the lack of biblical discipleship in today's church. This is a decline in church attendance, Bible reading, even Bible caring has been seen in each new generation. There is a corresponding decline in even knowing the Bible. How bad has it gotten? Well, here's, here's Mr. Barna. Less than half of all adults who go to church can name the four Gospels. Isn't that interesting? A majority of professing Christians struggle to identify more than two or three disciples. 60% of Americans cannot name even five of the Ten Commandments. 40% of Americans believe that when Jesus was on earth, he committed sin. So what's wrong with me sinning? He sinned, we sin. You know, it's just happy. 50% believe anyone who's generally good and does enough good for others during their life will earn a place in heaven. And 40% believe the Bible, the Quran, and the Book of Mormon are all different expressions of the same spiritual truth. Kind of sounds like the modern political world we're living in. We just blur it all. And doctrine is divisive. Well, the statistics indicate there's a gradual change in temperature over time. In general, biblical literacy is a growing trend, and discipleship that is being offered in churches is ineffective. You know what discipleship is about? It's about someone holding you up to a biblical standard and say, Do you know this is what God says? Do you know you're not doing that? Do you want to know how to connect those two? Oh, no, no. We, that might make people feel uncomfortable. I remember four years ago, I learned what makes people feel uncomfortable. In the morning service, you have people hold hands. Whole group of people said, we'll never come back to that church. Had them pray in small groups. Another whole group said, never go back to Calvary if you ever do that again. Wow. Then we had the audacity to turn to someone at communion, the most sacred moment in the life of the church, where we are holding in our hands pictures of Christ's body and blood, and you're supposed to turn to someone and tell them how much you're thankful Christ saved you. Boy, if you ever do that again, we will never come back. And I thought, hmm, are you in? Let the redeemed of the Lord what? Say so. Say so. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. See, that, that whole idea of discipleship, it's ineffective nowadays because what we don't want to do is we don't want to offend anybody but... God. That's the danger. One British pastor insightfully wrote, the Christian landscape is strewn with the wreckage of derelict, half-built towers, the ruins of those who began to build and were unable to finish. For thousands of people still ignore Christ's warnings and undertake to follow him without first pausing to reflect on the cost of doing so. You see, when I was in Tulsa, there was a big youth crusade in Tulsa. Tulsa is almost a city of a million, and they had a a big crusade, and what it was called is, it was based on the Coke thing, or the Pepsi. I don't remember what it was, but it was the popular, where it was try Coke or try Pepsi, you know, where they were doing at every supermarket the taste test, where, you know, if you were a Pepsi lover, you tried the other one, and it was like that. And so what they said is, we're going to do that across the, the city. And everybody in all the churches were, were, you know, you're supposed to wear a button, try Jesus. And, and it was a phenomenally successful thing, and they had thousands of kids that tried out Jesus, and thousands of them that didn't stick. And you know what happened? They were inoculated. You know, you have your little scar from your polo. You know what you did? You got a, a, tiny, a tiny case of polio, and now you're not going to get it anymore. And you have someone try Jesus and see if you, you know, feel better or something, and they said, I didn't. You've inoculated them so that they probably will never want to be shared the gospel. If you get shared the true gospel and it tells you what you are undone before the sight of a holy God and how totally helpless and how your heart is desperately evil and how completely marred and warped we are from the image of God and only supernatural change is your only hope, and that comes by you saying, I repent of all of my human effort, and I turn in simple faith in what Christ did alone. That's, that's not palatable, if you've already been inoculated with the try Jesus thing. The result is the greatest scandal of Christendom today. It's called nominal Christianity. In countries to which Christian civilizations have spread, large numbers of people have covered themselves with a decent, but thin veneer of Christianity. They have allowed themselves to become somewhat involved, enough to be respectable, but not enough to be uncomfortable. You know what one of the largest Christian nations is the, in the world is? Brazil. You know what they're also known for? The Carnival. 
And all of their thin veneer goes away during that time period. And the world flocks to watch the Brazilians by the millions engage in horrific God dishonoring activity. But they're Christian nations. Interesting. Thin veneer. Well, what's the solution to spiritual deception? Paul told Titus. Do you remember we spent a whole year on it? Titus. Do you remember Titus? You know what Paul told Titus? Each believer in Christ's church needs to be nurtured in God's word until they're mature enough to disciple someone else. Do you know what the best prophetic preparation is? It's knowing the truth so well that every time you read the paper, it just jumps out at you. More falsehood, more deception, more lies, more everything. I mean, this whole thing with let's coddle the Muslim things is exactly what the Bible says. Exactly what the, the Antichrist will do. The first horse he rides in on, the first seal that's undone when we get to chapter 6 is a white horse. And he rides out bringing peace. The Antichrist is going to say, all of you, all of you religions, I love you. Come to me. You Catholics, you're great. Oh, you Muslims are great. You Mormons are great. Just, and he'll just, he'll just be one happy family. Why? Because nobody knows doctrine. And nobody divides. And no, you know, nobody wants to be the bad guy and say what needs to be said. Paul details in Titus 2 the behavior that follows proper understanding, sound doctrine. What Paul said discipleship is about is that behavior is based on believing the right thing. And if you believe right, you'll behave right. And, and if your belief is healthy, if you are believing in wholesome, not, you know, uh, my wonderful wife just came back. She was visiting some friends that we've known for years, and she went to this pear tree that, that you know, 20 years ago was in the yard of a friend, and she brought on the airplane this pear back to me, and I was so excited, and I took the knife, and I went, and that poor thing I cut in half, you know, that was alive and wiggling in there. See, it was not a healthy pear. It had decay and worms on the inside but boy did it look beautiful on the outside and what what paul said is you've got to cut through and make sure that that there's healthy sound doctrine when paul gave these clear objectives for titus he taught the older men it was to show them how to become strong advertisements for god and so the best thing we need is to have healthy truth and god's discipleship program for christ church is right from the earliest days focused on guarding healthy faith and there's nothing more timely as we enter the end of days and the end of the physical world approach and earth's darkest spiritual hour than to have that lifelong process of guarding and feeding your mind and heart and look for evidence of your progress in fact Look, look at 1 Timothy, since you're back there. This is, this is prophetic. Look at, look at how you get ready for the Lord's return. 1 Timothy 4.15. Paul told Timothy, he didn't tell him to identify which of the ten Roman emperors were the bad guys, you know, and which one was going to do something that they shouldn't do. Rather, he said to them, meditate on these things. 1 Timothy 4.15. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Did you know that we should be measurably growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ? And we should be doing that in a community of believers who know us and love us and can say, you know what? You were just as anxious and impatient last year as you are right now. What is going on in your life? Christ is supposed to be mortifying that anxiety and that impatience. And Christ is supposed to be changing, you know, and what's going on? See, that's what the church is about. The church is not about saying, wow, Wow, look at those pictures. You had such a wonderful vacation. I mean, that's a part of it. It's nice to rejoice with those that rejoice. But then when you say, yeah, that's wonderful, but how are you doing? Is your family, do you have prayer time as a family? Oh, you're so busy you don't have prayer time. Do you read the Bible as a couple? No. As a family? No. Too busy? Mm. See, in a caring, loving church, that's taken as serious as, oh, you had a lump? You had a, a bad, bad lab test? Everyone gets concerned about that. Do they get concerned about being too busy for God? About uh, having, having mounting debt so that you have no freedom to do anything the Lord wants? You're enslaved to debt? See, those are things. See, spiritual people surrounding us. That's why 
We don't like to get close to people. We don't want them to know too much. Because they might say what we're doing is wrong, but we should welcome that. We should welcome uh, our, our spiritual progress. Timothy, 1 Timothy 4.15, Obey God by a healthy diet of sound doctrine, then share your life with others as you walk with them with Christ through life. So, I'm sorry, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, real quickly, to end this question, and I'm glad we're ending it, because uh, then we'll have a minute left for another one. Um, how do we, I mean, what is the best preparation for prophecy? Go to another prophecy conference? No. I don't think we need any more prophecy conferences. They go off to Bangor and they start hoarding food. You know, that is not the, the goal. The goal is not to build a place in the thumb to escape from 50 miles from all the horrific things that are going to happen. Did you know that the church is called to be right in the center of the horrific things and, and to be sharing the good news? I remember with Y2K, I had a friend, a very wealthy friend, the best-selling author in America in his line of books. He's made millions. He's a friend of mine. He invited me to his compound. I had to wear a, I had to wear a, a blindfold. And he took all kinds of turns and drove for hours. And finally showed me his compound. He spent millions on it. And there are many Christians who have done this. And there's nothing wrong if you do it, it's fine. But it doesn't match with the Bible. But you can do it. He had, he had an underground, underground steel-reinforced tunnels. He had, he had barbed wire and guard houses. He had an arsenal. He had enough food for years. He had buried diesel tanks. He could go for years with his diesel. He, he had an independent water supply. He had everything. And he said, but if you come with me, you can never go back. You know, Y2K in November, you went to this thing. He said, you can't go back. No one can know where this is. I said, what do you mean can't go back? I said, what are we here for? I mean, if the, all the lights go out, that's the greatest time. People finally wouldn't be online. You could talk to them for a minute, you know? I says, and let's go, and we'll go. Oh, no, no, no. Got to hide in the fortress. And see, that's not God's way. So what are we doing to, to get started? You want to really get ready for the deception coming? Learn some healthy verses. You know, we give away our little list of the 100 verses you ought to know. Uh, you really honestly ought to ask yourself, am I really exercising myself for godliness? Am I learning truth so I can guard my mind? Do I know more about everybody's, you know, favorite recipe than I know about God? How many verses can you right now say? That's the only thing that can bring health to our soul, is the Word of God. We know the statistics, and we know everything, and we know exactly the time, so we don't miss recording our favorite show. But do we know the Bible? Get some healthy verses. Number two, get a healthy study Bible. Now, this is unbiased personal preference. You know, I, I've read the Bible scores of times. I've read every study Bible. I've bought, purchased, and read every study Bible and get my hands on. You can go to my office and look at them. I must have 50 or 60 of them. And the very best one, and I've read, and you can tell me about yours, and I have, I have every one that I've ever been able to find. The best one I've ever found has 25,000 footnotes, and it covers every doctrine in the Bible. It's consistent, and there's not any, there, there might be things you don't agree with, but there is not one error in it. And, of course, that's my favorite. It's the MacArthur Study Bible. It costs $28 online. It's better than uh, pizza, Okay. And there's a picture of it. It's now even in the ESV. Do you know what? I can't imagine having a family where you don't have a study Bible, where you, where you have something to actually look up. If your kids say, wow, this doesn't agree. Did, did Jephthah really kill his daughter? You go, we'll call someone at the church. Why don't you look it up yourself? Right? That's how you show the kids how the truth is found and how they can be those who test all things instead of just asking someone to give you an answer. And then how do you know it's true? See, a study Bible shows you how to connect stuff. And a study Bible is vital. Finally, and this will even make some of you nervous, how about have a healthy theology book? How about invest in some tools for understanding systematic theology? Did you know right now we're into our second or third year of studying through Wayne Grudem's systematic theology? It only costs $30 online. Or you could get Ryrie's for $22 online. But Grudem's I like because Grudem, he's a professor at Phoenix Seminary, and he's a nice guy, and I know him. A uh, wonderful man of God, but he takes what the Roman Catholics believe and what the Arminians believe, what the Reform believes, what the Charismatics believe, and what the Baptists believe. 
as if there's only those five. And he puts them all side by side, and then he tells you what Wayne Grudem believes, and then he applies it. But he tells you what you've probably heard your whole life. For example, just his section on demons and the impact demons are having through movies and video games on children is one of the most powerful things I've ever read because he's examined what missionary kids are going through overseas in highly demonized areas and how it's affecting the kids and how the parents don't even know how the kids are being influenced by demonic powers. And just that, and understanding demons in the context of angels and everything else, but there's Grudem's book, his systematic theology. But all that to say this. We need to personally take in the hand the reversion to reverse any erosion of our Christian minds. And our minds are getting eroded. We sit around with friends and they go, Oh yeah, over at our church we're ordaining elders, you know, and Ray Vanderlaan believes in that, and you know, he's so good in the Holy Land, we should too. And, you know, Rick Warren and, and you know, Bill Hybels are loosening up on that, and so, and they're good people, and so, instead of saying, well, wait a minute, what did Paul say? Well, that's cultural. Really, how do you know it's cultural? What's that based on? Well, there's seven views of interpreting the Bible. Oh, are there really? See, we just let it go right by, and we think everybody's the same. Let me just say one more thing. I wouldn't be caught dead allowing my children to go to Valley Family Church if you knew what they teach over there, if you knew their doctrine. I wouldn't be caught dead. I have people in this church that say, well, I wish that you could be as good as Valley Family. I thought, do you know anything about biblical doctrine? Anything? I'm not criticizing the church. They're happy and friendly. It's some of my best friends. I see them all over town. I wish I could be as zealous for the Lord. They don't know what they teach. You need to guard healthy doctrine. Don't allow your Christianity to be eroded. Don't allow unhealthy doctrine in. Now that I've said enough to offend everybody, let's all stand. Aren't you glad we're not having one more question? Whoa, we would get in trouble tonight. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. And my heart's desire tonight is that we focus the same fervency that we have for knowing the latest details about Israel and you know and the ten nations and all that stuff and focus in on being as great a watchdogs of biblical doctrine and usefulness to God which is called sanctification.